uh, pun sekarang kita dah ada 30 orang YouTube pun um, dah dah streaming kita nak mulakan ke berapa dah dua setengah Perang dengar tak? Hello. Sekarang kita dah ada 30 orang. YouTube pun um, dah streaming. Kita nak mulakan ke berapa? Dah dua setengah? Alright ni, kita boleh start now. Okay. Okay, Assalamualaikum dan selamat petang uh, kepada peserta webinar pada hari ini um, Rubrik Development for Assessment by Professor Dr. Wong Sulwan daripada Fakulti Pengajian Pendidikan UPM uh, Sesi hari ini uh, berjalan selama 2 jam So, um, kita menggunakan format uh, Zoom webinar So that's why uh, attendees cannot see um, the microphone uh, apa ikon tu. So untuk tanya soalan sila tulis uh, soalan anda di Q&A box ataupun boleh raise hand. Uh, so host akan enable your mic. So you need to unmute your mic to ask question. Okay um the trainer akan menjawab soalan uh, sambil-sambil uh, webinar ini dijalankan. So untuk tidak membuang masa saya uh, serahkan sesi ini kepada Prof Wong. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Wong and I'd like to say thank you to Kate for inviting me to do this session yeah, for this afternoon. So for today's learning material, yeah, you can get the material from my Padlet and um, you can also scan for the material. Yeah? So there are two slides, there are two documents that I've uploaded to Padlet the PowerPoint slides as well as uh, I have prepared a worksheet, yeah? a hands-on worksheet that we will do after we have completed the uh, PowerPoint slides. So I've been informed also that Kate will share the PowerPoint slides yeah? after, after the uh, webinar session. All right, so this is the uh, learning outcome yeah, that I hope to achieve for this course. So upon the completion of the training, you should be able to differentiate the various types of rubrics. So there are various types or different types of rubrics available uh, for us to use. I'll share with you two types of rubrics for today. And then you should be able to evaluate the suitability of rubrics yeah, for the intended assessment task. So what kind of assessment are you going to be giving to your students and what or which rubric is, a, is considered appropriate for your assessment? And lastly, I hope that everyone will be able to design and develop a rubric. So this session today is more of, uh, first I'll share with you, give you an idea what is a rubric, the definition of rubric, the types of rubric available, and then uh, we will go into a little bit deeper where we look into the anatomy of the rubric, right? So when you talk about rubric, how does it look like? And lastly, this is what I hope for everyone after you've completed this session, you should be able to design and develop your own rubric. So as I go along, if you have any questions like um, mentioned earlier, you, you, can, you can raise your hand and you can stop and you can type your questions in the box and I will uh, respond yeah, in mind uh, whether I will respond accordingly. So just like I mentioned, yeah, so this is what I will be doing. First, we'll start off with the definition of rubrics. What is a rubric? And then uh, we will look at the types of rubrics. After we have understood yeah, the types of rubrics, we, we know how it looks like. I will then explain to you the criteria yeah, and as well as the rating scale for rubric. And lastly, let me let me activate my uh, pen. Yeah? So I will be able to point it out. And lastly, this is what I hope for everyone. Yeah? You should be able to design and develop your own rubric to suit your assessment. 
So the question is, what is a rubric? I'm sure many of you have seen or have used a rubric, but maybe you are not too aware that this is a certain type of rubric. So I'm going to share with you two types of rubric, which is the first one, analytic rubric, and the second one is a holistic rubric. So let's look at the definition of a rubric. It's a tool, all right? So it's a tool, it's a, it's a, it's a measure actually, comprising a set of criteria, which has possible levels of performance quality on the criteria developed to assess any types of students' work. So this work could be from written, it could be in oral form, or it could be in visual form something which you are able to observe. So when you talk about performance, yeah? So what kind of performance are there? So let me share with you the types of performance. There are two types of performance. The first one is processes, and the second one is product. So when we say that the type of performance yeah, is in the form of a process, what do you mean by that? It could be in a physical, it could be a physical skills. It could be the use of equipment, oral communication, or even work habits. Yeah? So these are some examples of what we mean by processes. You will be able actually to measure yeah, your students' performance when they are playing a musical instrument or they are preparing a slide for a microscope or even making a speech to the class. So this is what we mean by processes and for products. So when you talk about performance yeah, in the form of a product, what does it mean? It is actually constructed objects. It could be in a form of what we say as written essays, teams, reports, and so forth. And these are some very straightforward examples here yeah, when we talk about products. For example, um, you can actually assess students' skills yeah, in developing or creating a wooden bookshelf or um, handmade apron, right? So these are some examples of what we mean by the types of performance and from the perspective of processes as well as products. Now let's look at the anatomy of a rubric. So when I say or use the word anatomy, it means that the component of a rubric, what does it actually constitute? Yeah? Now, I'd like to draw your attention to this one. Criteria that describe the product. So this is an example of an analytic rubric. This is one of the most common, yeah, most common rubric used in education. In when we are teaching, we want to assess our students, yeah. We give them a certain task, some kind of homework, some kind of assessment. This is a very popular and widely used type of rubrics. I'll explain to you why, but before that, let's look at the component of an analytic rubric. Yeah? So it consists of criteria, which is on the left hand side yeah, of this table. And each of these criteria, right? So you have criterion A, B, and C. What is it that you want to measure in terms of the assessment that you've given your students? Then we have the rating scale. So what is the rating scale? The rating scale actually shows the, the level of competency or the quality, it's, it's in a continuum. So the example that I have for you today is measured in terms of low, moderate, high. So you could have more than three rating scales. So what I have here is only three, yeah? So we can have four, maybe excellent or highest, something like that, yeah? And then the last part would be the indicators. So what is the indicator? Indicator is actually showing 
the student's ability or the performance, or sometimes, yeah, or it's widely used the term performance indicators. What are the qualities that you want the students to exhibit when you want to measure your students' um, product or the process? So basically, this is how an analytic rubric look like. So I have mentioned two keywords here. You will hear these two words here. I use over and over again throughout this session. So the first one is called criteria. And the second one is called performance indicators. So in the second part of our session for today, yeah, you are going to learn how to create your own rubrics by having your own criteria. And you would also learn how to develop or craft your own performance indicators. So these are the two terms that I want you to be familiar with, which I'm going to use quite uh, a bit yeah, throughout this session. Now, this is an example of how a rubric, an analytic rubric look like. This is a rubric for a scientific report, yeah? So, the one on the left-hand side earlier on I mentioned is the criteria. So what is a criteria? So for example, when you talk about reports, what do you actually assess? What component of, um, what, does, what does a report consist of? Most likely it has an introduction. It has some information about the research. It has the problem, the purpose, as well as the procedure. So, People in the sciences, yeah, probably uh, for the lab sessions, your student would probably prepare a report and submit to you. So that is one assessment, the type of assessment that you are giving to your students. And how do you assess your students? Perhaps this is one good example of using a rubric to measure. So if you look at these columns here, Earlier, if you recall in the slide that I talked about the anatomy of a rubric, we have the rating scale. So this one, we have beginning, which is awarded one mark, developing two marks or scores, yeah? Accomplish and exemplary. And so this is where you key in or you write the scores that you want to give to your students. Now, Earlier, I mentioned that this is the criteria. So let's look at if you want to award one mark to your student for the report, yeah? Then this is because the report in terms of introduction does not give any information about what to expect in the report. So there's nothing much that the student has written. As compared to someone whom you want to give full marks, which is four, presents a concise lead in to the report. So the report is very concise, it's very complete. So you see that when you move from here towards the right hand side, you will see that the scores are increasing. So the higher the score, the higher the quality the report is in terms of the introduction. So what we have in all these boxes here, these are called the performance descriptors. They are describing the quality of the work of each of your students' report. This is another example of an analyt analytic rubric. Now you see that this is a little bit more detailed. Why do I say that it's a little bit more detailed? You see that I have actually provided some percentage. So always remember the one on the left hand side is the criteria. So these are all the criteria. So this is a rubric for a lesson plan development. So all of us are all very familiar with lesson plans and when we are teaching, we need to prepare a lesson plan. So this is a rubric that I gave to my students when I wanted them to prepare a lesson plan. So what are the components that I wanted to measure? What are the criteria that I wanted them to have in their lesson plan? Of course, when you have your lesson plan, the first thing that you want to look at would be the 
instructional goals and objectives. And then how would they actually be carrying out their instruction, their instructional strategies? So for the goals and objectives, I have allocated 15%. Instructional strategies, 40%. And assessment 15, technology use 20 and so forth. So there are percentages that I have given for each component. You may not want to have this percentages. So it is up to you whether how detailed you want your rubric to be. Yeah? And if you look here, the rating scales here starts with beginning. And I have given a range here, which is zero to five marks. And when I want to give a little bit higher, then the students would be, would be considered to be at the developing stage, six to 10. So why is there a range between six to 10, zero to five? So sometimes when I feel that my students are considered to be at the beginning stage, but student A seems to be doing a little bit better than student B. So maybe student B, yeah, the scores would be different than student A. So that's why there is a range. So as you go higher or to the right-hand side of the table, you will see that the rating scales goes into exemplary. So as I said before, these are your performance descriptors. So for the scores here, you can see, this is where I key in the marks. And then I have the total divided by two. So 100%, I decided that this is going to be 50% of the assignment. And you see that the descriptors here, yeah? They are all quite long because I want to be precise. Now, when I talk about rubrics here, there are times that you don't have to develop your rubrics. You don't have to spend a lot of time or effort to develop your own rubrics. You can actually Google. There are, there are a lot of rubrics available online. Yeah? So for example, this rubric, when I Google, yeah? rubrics plus lesson plan, there are so many rubrics available for free for anyone to use. You can use them and you can actually adapt it to your types of assignment that you've assigned to your students. Now let's go to another rubric. This is another type of rubric. And you would see that uh, this is a digital story storytelling assignment, yeah? uh, a rubric that I have downloaded from this website here. Now this is a little bit different because you will see that uh, the higher point, the highest points awarded will be on the left hand side. So it really depends on uh, what is your preference. Do you want it to be um, more scores on the left hand side? So you start from right and you go towards the left. So these are the category or like I mentioned, these are the criteria. So what are the criteria when you talk about digital storytelling assignment? You want to measure point of view, dramatic questions, voice, soundtrack, emotions. Now, the hardest part about developing your rubric is to come up with good descriptors. These are what I mentioned earlier, performance descriptors. The more detailed your performance descriptors are, the more precise your marking is going to be. And it, it is also very useful for your students, yeah? When you give the rubrics to your students. So for me, I discovered that when I gave my assignment, I did not give the rubrics to the students. There were a lot of confusion among my students. And later when I found out that they were asking a lot of questions, I decided that when I assign this task or when I give out the assignments, it is best to give it together with the rubrics. I'll share with you um, why it is good to share or to give your students the rubrics yeah, together with the assignment. Right. Earlier on, I had mentioned that there are two types of rubric. The first one is analytics rubric. Now I'm going to share with you the holistic rubric. So how does a holistic rubric look like? It's a very simple table, very much simpler than the analytic rubric. You have the descriptions here. 
yeah, which is actually the criteria and descriptors are written here. And then you have the rating scale, which is on the left hand side here. So it depends on you whether you want to give one point or you want to give 10% here, you decide as the course instructor. So this is an example of a complete holistic rubric. Now, quite many people like to use a holistic rubric because it is fast. If you compare it to an analytic rubric, yeah? analytic rubric measures every criteria. So if you look at this table here, yeah, you don't see the criteria on the left hand side, but they are all lumped together in one row. So if you want to give five marks to your students, that particular assignment needs to have these, these qualities, these descriptors. It must meet these performance descriptors. So that is the difference between an analytic rubric as well as a holistic rubric, yeah? So I'm gonna share with you now um, one example of an assignment that I gave to my students, yeah? Last semester. And this particular assignment measured C6, yeah? The learning outcome C6, which is the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy. So this is the assignment that I wanted my students to do. First, I asked them to um, prepare an e-portfolio. So e-portfolio is an example, oh, sorry, e-portfolio is an individual assignment throughout the semester. So this is an individual work that every student had to prepare. And the students can use any platform to sign up for an e-portfolio account. So either it's a blog spot or a Wix, yeah? It could be anything. So I give examples to the students. They can choose one of these platforms to prepare their e-portfolio. So the weightage is 10, 10%, and the students had to submit by week 14, yeah? In uh, our Putra Blast. So what was the student's uh, role here? They had to prepare the e-portfolio to post updates and progress about the project. And they also had to share the reflections based on the activities done throughout the semester. Yeah? So they had to write how they felt, what they uh, thought about the entire assignment. And this is the rubric that was developed. Yeah? So it was developed by my colleague, Dr. Masnidia, who came up with this analytic rubric. She actually came up with two. Let me see if I have it here. Yes, we have two. So I'll show you how an analytic rubric yeah, can be transformed into a holistic rubric. So it depends on your preference, whether you prefer to use analytic or holistic. Now, an analytic rubric yeah, is more precise because you are measuring the criteria. So there are three criteria here for the rubric yeah, um, that was developed for the portfolio assignment. The first one measured communication of reflection. The second one measured the student's content knowledge. And the third one measured the student's effort, how much effort they actually put in. So this was an individual assignment. And Remember when I said the rating scales as it goes further from the left to the right? <clears throat> Excuse me. We have adequate, developing, competent, and excellent. So excellent would be awarded four marks as compared to adequate one mark. So look at the performance descriptors here. Learner is merely reporting the summarization of events and learning activities. So the student is just reporting, yeah? not actually explaining, not showing originality there. And because of that, we feel that the student deserves a one. So as 
the student here, all right, compared to, let's say, student B, who seems to be giving a little bit more, yeah, in terms of communication of reflection. The learner translates the learning activity to his or, or her knowledge construction, and even includes some examples and supporting evidence like pictures. So then the student would get two marks. So imagine when you give this rubric to your students, Together with the assignment at the start of the semester, the student would have a clear understanding of what is your expectation. They would actually have a better understanding of what is required for this particular assignment. If you actually do not give this rubric, yeah, so some lecturers or some instructor, instructors, they don't prefer to share with their students uh, the rubric for certain reasons, which means that you need to give very clear, precise instruction to your students when you are handing out this assignment. Yeah? But based on my experience, um, no matter how precise, no matter how much time you spend to explain to your students what they need to do, there will be a lot of things that they miss. Yeah? For example, they are not listening to you, or they were not in class. Um, they, they didn't realize that it was actually part of the requirement that you wanted and so forth. So this is what I discovered um, before I started using rubrics for my students. Now, just now when I mentioned that an analytic rubric can be translated or transformed into a holistic rubric. So let's say, for example, you decide that you are going to use a holistic rubric because you feel that you do not want it to be so um, complicated. You can, dis you can now transform your analytic rubric into a holistic rubric. You see that the difference here now, adequate less or equals to 49%. So it has changed. Yeah? The percentage has changed. And if the student is excellent, then you would give more than 85%. And what is inside here is actually the combination of all the performance descriptors. Learner is merely reporting and summarization of events, given a summary of the events or learning activities. Learners show limited ability to connect to the theories of diffusion of innovation to the learning activities and portfolio has less than 14 updates. Now, if you recall, let me go back to the analytic rubric. It is actually a combination. I've lumped it together. These three performance indicator into one when I have transformed it into a holistic rubric. So that's how you actually transform yeah, your rubrics from an analytic rubric into a holistic or vice versa, depending on your needs yeah, and uh, which you prefer when you are doing your assessment. Now, let's look at the... Um, Next slide, yeah, so this slide shows that uh, there are two types of rubrics. The first one is called an analytic rubric and the second one is called a holistic rubric, yeah. So an analytic rubric consists of um, each of the criteria is scored individually as compared to the holistic rubric when you apply all the criteria at once to get an overall judgment. So basically holistic rubric is suitable for summative assessment. When you want to assess the overall performance of the students. Most educators yeah, or most instructors prefer to use the holistic rubric. But when you want to do a, a formative assessment, yeah, you want to be very precise, you want to give feedback to your students how to improve, then your choice would be analytic. Okay, let me switch off my WhatsApp first. It's making a lot of noise. Minute. 
Okay. So let's look at uh, the next slide. Now, the next slide tells you, or explains to you the characteristics of criteria. So just now I mentioned there are two keywords in this uh, particular session yeah, for today. Criteria, and then the second one is performance descriptors. So when you talk, of, when you talk about criteria, what are the desired characteristics of the criteria? First, it's got to be appropriate. What do you mean by appropriate? Yeah? The criteria or each criterion represents an aspect of a standard or the syllabus or the curriculum. What is the instructional goal or what is the learning outcome that you want to achieve? Yeah? So the criteria has to match that or it should be aligned to that. And the second one is definable. What do you mean by definable? It should be, you should be able to define your criteria. So each criteria has a clear, agreed upon meaning yeah, that both students and teachers understand. So when you develop your criteria, yeah, both your students yeah, as well as you, you're the instructor, or maybe you're developing for your other colleagues to use the rubrics, yeah, they must be able to understand what exactly you must define what it means. So for example, if I'm measuring, I want to develop a rubric yeah, for a lesson plan. When I say that I want to measure the student's learning outcome, what does learning outcome mean in this criteria? Next would be observable, something that can be observed. So your criteria describes a quality in the performance that can be perceived so when you talk about perceived, it can be seen or heard, yeah, usually by someone other than the person performing. So it is something that you can see. So you are assessing your students using your rubric. What the students is doing or what the students has produced must be observable to you. You are able to assess, you are able to measure. The next characteristic is distinct from other, from one another. So each criterion yeah, identifies a separate aspect of the learning outcomes the performance is intended to assess. So it must be distinct enough to differentiate. If this is the performance, uh, if, if this is the criteria for the first, for the, uh, we have, let's say, three criteria. So criteria number one should be distinct from criteria number two. Criteria number two should be distinct from criteria number one and three. So this is what it means. The next one is complete. What do you mean by complete? When you put your criteria together, it describes the whole of the learning outcomes. So you put it together, criteria one, two, three, that whole three criteria reflects the entire performance that you want to measure. And lastly, it is able to support descriptions along a continuum of quality. So each criterion can be described over a range of performance levels. So this is referring to the performance indicators. So this is what we mean by um, the desired characteristics of the criteria that we have actually chosen to measure our students yeah, using the, 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 the rubric that we have developed. Next would be the performance indicators. What are the desired characteristics of the performance indicators? Yeah? Number one, it has to be descriptive. You should be able to describe the performance. Yeah? Uh, the performance is described in terms of what is observed in the work. Something that you're able to describe, something that you're able to show the quality. Next would be clear. It should be clear to you as well as to the students. So we do not want to develop a rubric which is just for you. You are the only one who understand it, but the students do not know what exactly are you talking about, yeah? So it has to be clear. Next one would be cover the whole range of performance, yeah? So it is wide enough to be able to measure the entire performance that you are looking for. So performance is described from one extreme of the continuum of quality to another for each criterion. 
Next, distinguish among levels. So each of these performance indicators, they are levels. So they should be different enough from each level, from one level to another, that it can be categorized, yeah? And it should be possible to match examples of work to performance descriptions at each level. Next would be center the target performance. The description of performance at the level expected by the standard curriculum goal or the lesson objective. What is it that you're looking for? What is it that you hope your students are able to achieve at the end of your lesson or at the end of your course? And lastly, feature parallel descriptions from level to level. So what does it mean? It means that the performance descriptions at each level of the continuum from a given standard describe different quality levels. So we are looking at the student's quality, yeah? the performance, you're talking about student's performance, how good is the quality? And this quality has got to be distinct in the sense that you can say, I'm gonna give five marks for this particular criteria. For student A, I'm gonna give one mark only to student C. So these are the desired characteristics here yeah, of both the, just now we have seen the criteria as well as the performance indicators or performance descriptors. And so there are quite several um, different terms that you may come across here, yeah? but actually they mean the same. So what we have covered from the start of this session, yeah, first we did the definition, right? Then I share with you the components of the rubrics. So we have two types of rubrics, the analytics rubrics, as well as the holistic rubrics. And then I shared with you, I discussed with you the desired characteristics of the criterion, as well as the um, performance indicators. Now let's look at what are the purpose, yeah? or what is the purpose of using a rubric? Why do we use rubrics? There must be a lot of uh, reasons yeah, why people are very fond of using rubrics. Yeah? Right, these are some reasons, yeah, of, or some purpose. First, to assess performance. Right, this is usually what we want to achieve. Yeah, we want to use a rubric. We want to assess our students' performance based on the task or some assignments that you have assigned to your students. But make sure that your rubric aligns with the learning outcome. So look at your course synopsis or your course outline. How many learning outcomes are there? Yeah, and then all the learning outcomes here yeah, are indicated by performance. So when we talk about performance, I mentioned earlier. Uh, it is what the students are able to do, what the students are able to produce or make, say, or even write. What are the benefits? There must be some benefits here yeah, that why rubric is considered as popular when we want to assess our students. Yeah? All right, this is a blog written by my student. Yeah? Remember, I had given my student a portfolio assignment. And this is what this student wrote on one of his, uh, one of the chosen platform. So this is a student from the Bachelor Pendidikan Jasmani. Yeah? And he had indicated, yeah, pada minggu ke-9, saya bersama kumpulan mendapat markah kurang memuaskan tentang lesson plan. So I had given the assignment to the student. Yeah? I wanted them to prepare a lesson plan for a subject that they were going to teach in school. So for this case would be physical education. So why did they get so little marks? Yeah? So markah kurang memuaskan. So this is what he shared on the blog. Yeah? While um, when I asked my students to reflect, what happened? 
Why did it get so little marks here actually? Hal ini kerana banyak elemen yang tidak dimasukkan di dalam lesson plan. So when you actually are using an analytic rubric, yeah, it is important for you to be doing formative assessment. Meaning that when you give the assignment to your students, you assess it and you return it to your students so that they have opportunities for them to improve. They know what went wrong. Yeah? So in this case, yeah, for these students, they scored quite low because there were many elements that were not included in the lesson plan. Although I had actually explained to them several times what needed to be included in the lesson plan. What I can actually um, get from this experience is that usually students don't pay 100% to what you're saying. And because of that, they don't do really well. It's not that they are incompetent, but because they do not know what is required yet, and they are not aware what is required for the particular assignment. So he said that sebagai contoh, set induksi kami lalai tidak masukkan ke dalam lesson plan. Jadi prof sediakan kami rubrik sebagai panduan. So this was an experience that I had when I had not given the rubrics to my student. I gave the assignment and I explained to them what they were required to do, what are my expectations. And true enough, they didn't do that well. So based on what happened to my student, I decided that I will and I should be given, I should be giving the rubrics together with the assignment at the start of the semester for the benefit of the student as well as for myself. Yeah. So let's look at what are the benefits of using rubrics in our teaching. What what is so what are the advantages to our students as well as to ourselves as instructors? Yeah. Now let's let's start here first okay, on the left hand side, the first one. Rubrics allow us to communicate expectations. What do you mean by communicate expectations? Students will be able to know what is it that they are expected to perform. What is it that they are expected to deliver? What, I, what is it that I want from them as an instructor? So the expectation is clearly communicated to them. So we put it in a rubric form and you hand it together with your assignment. You put it on, my, on the Putra Blast. So I usually tell my students, all right, assignments are available on the Putra Blast together with the rubrics. So students will have a look at the, at the assignment. And then at the same time, they look at the rubrics. This would be very much helpful to all the students because the rubric will communicate what is it that they need to have in the assignment? And because of that, yeah, once they are aware, they know very clearly, okay, they look at the criteria. There are three criteria in this rubric. They need to have all these three criteria. And they would strive to have all these three criteria in their assignment. Yeah? So because when they are clear, they are aware of what is expected of this particular assignment, this would improve the student's performance, right? So what we want is the students are able to do their best. They are able to produce quality work. We are not there to penalize our students, yeah? We are not there to give them very little marks. I always believe that when we give assignments to our students, we give them opportunities to improve. So which means that our effort yeah, to grade the student's assignment yeah, gets more. You have to be keeping up with the student's assignment. So when you give them opportunity yeah, um, to have the rubrics beforehand, before they start, the, uh, start doing the assignment, you will see that they give you better quality assignments. Yeah? So this actually translates into improved performance. Next would be informative feedback. When you have rubrics here, yeah, you give back to the students and the students re realize that they scored three marks out of five. What went wrong? 
why did they get three out of five? Why didn't they get more than, you know, four? Why didn't they get full marks? They know that there is some weakness, yeah, in their assignment. So that is what we mean by informative feedback. So I realized when I use rubrics in my assessment, students don't come, lesser students in that sense, yeah, come forward and ask me, why did I score 70%? Why did I score less than my friends? It is because the rubrics here very clearly tells them that what they have produced in their assignments, they deserve a three or they deserve 70%. Yeah? So this is what we mean by informative feedback. And in order for the students to get maximum marks, they know what they need to do because the performance indicators would have actually given them the information or they would get the idea from looking at the rubrics. Next would be promote thinking and learning. So what we want from our students is not that we want them to think of getting A's, A minus and so forth. We want them to think hard. If I want to score five maximum for this assignment and they look at the rubric, that is the highest mark, what they need to do, what they need to include in their report. So it makes them think harder, all right? It makes them learn. The learning process occurs, yeah? Because they know that if they want to get or they want to strive for a maximum points, yeah? Five, this is what they need to have. And how do they find that? They need to work harder and they need to think. What do I need to include? How do I write the paragraph, for example? And lastly, inspire fairness. Using rubrics, I can say that it's very fair. Students will understand why they score five instead of three, yeah? Because they did not meet the criteria that was actually, or they did not meet the uh, performance indicators that was set for five months. So inspire fairness is that what they get, yeah, is because this is what they had in the uh, assignments. If they had done very well, they got, let's say, more than 85%, yeah? They deserve it because all the performance indicators, yeah, were met in the rubric. And what I noticed, yeah, over the years that I've been using rubric is that students do not come and demand for marks. They are very, generally very contented. They feel that that's the marks they deserve because it's very clear cut in that sense that the rubrics shows um, very clearly why they scored low or why they scored high. Okay, um, I want to share this video yeah, uh, with you. This video is by Susan Brookhart. I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to start uh, playing the um, the video, I hope it works. It worked earlier on just now. So it's a four minute video that um, this person yeah, talks about what is a rubric and why a rubric is important. Yeah? So basically she actually summed up what I have shared with you for today's session. Yeah? So let's hear, let's see whether you can hear the, the video. Yeah? And talk about what it is they're trying to learn and then they can they can see it as they're doing it because they have language to use with it then then it's it's really powerful and teachers who get that far, oh i'm sorry um, i need to start it really restart an yeah. author. hi my name is sue brookhart i'm an independent consultant and author i've been asked to talk a little bit about rubrics what they are what their benefits are and how it is for teachers who use them. A rubric is a, an assessment tool that has two parts, criteria and performance level descriptions that describe performance from poor through good on each of the criteria. Uh, if, if it's just criteria, you've got a checklist. The key for rubrics is that each criterion is accompanied by 
descriptions of what work looks like at each level. And I say descriptions of quality, not um, numbers or directions. So a good description wouldn't say has three sources. It would say something like the sources used are relevant and credible and uh, information that's valuable to the students. So um, rubrics to be useful have to be effective and well-crafted. And, and that's sometimes a problem. There are a lot of bad rubrics out there that are just in code directions. You have to uh, have a fit about those because they really mismeasure students. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, I, I'm not going to be able to show you now, but it's, it's really sad how um, students can follow directions and, and still not learn something and the rubrics will pick it up if they're not designed to do that. But assuming you have good rubrics, there is evidence that students with who use rubrics actually do learn better. And uh, the reason is not the rubrics. There's no magic about charts or boxes. Or, the reason is that rubrics encode in a way that students can see and use the qualities of good work, what they're trying to learn, and how they'll know it from their work, whether they've learned it. And that's what research from primary through university level has shown to be effective. Many of the studies I'm thinking about have used rubrics to do this kind of, of uh, clarifying of learning goals and success criteria. But it's, it's not the rubrics, it's the fact that, that you have a way to show students that that's tangible, that they can keep with them, that they can refer to. And uh, you can use it for feedback, they can use it for self-assessment, in fact, I would go so far as to say if you're only going to use rubric as a scoring tool and not share it with students and not get students to use it, save your energy. You need, um, you, you can use a point system for, for getting a grade. What's, what's important about rubrics is that they put success criteria in a form that students can read. How teachers feel about this, usually teachers enjoy using rubrics. Once they get over this idea that, they, that they're not going to put many, many criteria, um, the directions kind of criteria, usually, uh, rubrics usually have too many criteria, and uh, their performance level descriptions are usually counting things. And those rubrics are easy to write and easy to use, but uh, I would, would not even say they're worthless. I'd say they're, they're dangerous. As they mismeasure students. They don't let students look at the quality of their thinking, and they don't let teachers do that. So uh, teachers ha have this hurdle to get over because there is a misconception out there that, that rubrics are basically directions in a box, and that is not true. But when you get effective rubrics effectively crafted and you use them with students and you teach them what those performance level descriptions mean, and you illustrate them with examples of work at those different levels and students can talk about what it is they're trying to learn and when they can they can see it as they're doing it because they have language to use with it then then it's it's really powerful and teachers who get that far um, really see that value and uh, and are able to use rubrics for both self-assessment formative assessment and then ultimately the same rubrics or summative assessment for grading. Uh, and it's a great tool to connect those, uh, those assessment functions. Okay, so that is about rubric. Yep, so I'm going to go back to my slides. Hi, this is a quick video to show you how to write better quality criteria for your rubrics, which are the the mystery chocolates, yeah? In the box that the rubric should be used in conjunction. Okay. Let me go back to my slide. So the, if you want to watch again, the video, yeah? I put the link in my slides, yeah? And that basically is the summary. Yeah? So uh, she is actually the author 
of this book. So I would really recommend you, if you're interested in it, to read and to find out more of, about rubrics. This author, Susan Brookhart, the lady that you saw in the video, yeah, she came up with this very simple book. I enjoyed reading her book, yeah? How to Create and Use Rubrics for Formative Assessment and Grading. You can refer to this book. All right, we have done one hour of the session. So I think probably we can have some Q&A um, or if you want to take a break, I'm not too sure. So are there any questions that you'd like to ask me? Okay, there's a question here. Based on the example you gave for scientific scientific report rubric, what COPO does it assess? Well, it depends on your course outcome. Um, whether you are looking at, first of all, your, your, your course outcome, yeah? are you looking at cognitive? Are you looking at psychomotor? Or are you looking at effective? And um, the rubrics would actually be related to the CO. So what are the course outcome that you have in your syllabus? So, and what level is it? Let's say, for example, your cognitive level. So is it at C5? So when you talk about C5, what exactly are you measuring um, in terms of C5 for your assignment? Is there any other questions? So basically, when you when you design your rubrics, yeah, you are the one who is going to decide what level of the course outcome that you want to measure. And make sure that it aligns back with your learning outcome. All right. So there are no questions. So I suggest that maybe we can take five, a short break. Uh, we, let's see what's the time now. So it's um, 3.35. Maybe we can come back at, uh, oh, it's, it's 3.30 now. So maybe we can come back at 3.35. So we take a five minute break. So what will happen in the next session is that I will share with you um, hands-on tutorial. So this hands-on tutorial, yeah, I have prepared a worksheet for you and it will walk you through on how to develop your rubrics. I also would encourage you, if you have any rubrics yeah, that you want to share with this session with all of us here, um, I would love to see your rubric and we pro probably will be able to discuss that uh, in the second session. So let's take a short break now and we'll come back at 3.35.
right, so um, is everyone back from the short break? I think while waiting for the rest, let me answer some questions. Yeah? I Sorry, I missed the first question. Yeah? There's this question about PO, program outcome. How do we develop how to relate rubric with program outcome by Noor Huzaili? How to measure the program outcome according to percentage? Um, I think program outcome, if you look at your program and what is the program outcome that you expect from your um, particular program? Yeah. So let's say, for example, I've seen program outcomes like Students, yeah, uh, they want the students to continue with their studies. Uh, how many percent of the students, let's say, menyambung um, pelajaran ke peringkat siswasa? Or how many percent of the students find a job within six months? So from there, you can actually come up with the criteria that you want to measure for your program outcome. And then you decide on the rating skills. And I believe that most faculties are now working on the rubric, um, the survey that they are now administering to their graduates after, let's say, uh, four years of study. And they want to look whether the program outcome has been achieved. So look back at your program outcome. How many program outcomes are there? And then what are the criteria that they want to achieve? And from there, you relate that to your rubrics. All right, the next question that I see on my screen is, uh, this question comes from Lini Hashim, yeah? Referring to the analytical rubric for e-portfolio, how does effort measure students C6? Now, obviously, effort is not measuring knowledge, yeah? But the rubric that was developed actually measured more than knowledge. So it means that you have to ensure the rubrics, yeah, is aligned to your learning outcome and as well as measuring something which is more. So it means that your, your rubric, it doesn't have to be confined to just the learning outcome. It could be something more that you want to measure you want the students to achieve uh, and you want to reward the students. So of course, effort is not something which is indicated in the learning outcome, but you want to reward the students for their hard work. So it can be included in your rubric. So did I... Um, actually answer all the questions. Are there any more questions that you'd like to put on the um, chat box before we move on to the second half of the um, session? Yeah? So the second half of the session, I want you all to access this hands-on activity. Yeah? Just give me a minute. So this is the hands-on activities that I created yeah, on how to create a rubric. And where do you actually download it from? I'm going to share with you the address as well as the QR code. Yeah? Just give me a minute so that I can switch back to my PowerPoint slide. Here it is. Uh, just a minute, I have. Let me look for the slide, yeah. Here it is. So please scan um, this website. You can go to my Padlet to download the uh, worksheet. I have prepared the worksheet. You can download from there. I have put it in a Microsoft Word uh, format so that you can actually type straight into your 
computers yeah, as we work along. And we move along for this second half of the workshop. Okay, um, did you manage to download the file, the learning materials here for today's website? So let me continue with um, some more examples so before we go on to the second half of the session. This is an example from the rubric PNGK Bersepadu, yeah, prepared by the higher, um, higher education. Yeah? This is to measure the Kemahiran Insania, KI, yeah? CTS, Kemahiran Berkomunikasi. In this rubric, you see that this is a very detailed rubric in the sense that it first measures the verbal communication. And under verbal communication, there are, let me activate my pen first, there are sub components, yeah, sub-criteria. So what we have here on the left-hand side are the criteria. And then you have the sub-criteria, which is divided into three. And these are the rating scale, which is very weak, weak, fair, good, very good. So you have five rating scales. Uh, this one level of applicability is actually referring to whether it's diploma level or whether it's bachelor level yeah, or postgraduate level. So it's not necessary to have that in the rubric. And you will see here when the person is described as very weak, yeah, so the student is not able to deliver ideas clearly and require major improvement. As compared to someone who is very good then this person is described as being able to deliver ideas with great clarity. Okay? And this rubric measures the learning outcome, CS, which is the Mahiran Berkomunikasi, communication skills. Yeah? And what are the ways to deliver? Would be problem-based learning, case studies, and so forth. Yeah? And how do you assess? Would be through seminars, group work, and so forth. So in my slide, I have given you quite a bit of examples, which I will not go through uh, in this session. Yeah? So I will just quickly run through them. This is for Kemahiran Social dan Bertanggungjawab, yeah? so TS. And you will see that, again, for teamwork, how do you measure teamwork? You have two sub-criteria, which is foster good relationship, and the second one is alternate roles. And you see that these are all the performance descriptors. Okay, so I'm going to go next. I'm going to skip the slides, yeah? So I hope that you'll be able to look through uh, once you have uh, access to my slides. Again, just now I gave you the learning materials QR code. You can download my notes as well as the worksheet that I mentioned uh, earlier just now. So I hope you already have downloaded the worksheet, yeah, which we can start working um, together after this. So it's a step-by-step -step hands-on activities here, yeah, and um, it helps you from the beginning until the very end yeah, to develop or to craft your own rubrics. So I put it in a diagram, I've simplified it in a diagram. What are the five steps required when you develop your own rubrics? Yeah? Number one, first, uh, it helps very much here for you 
to define the purpose of the learning task. What is it that you intend for the students here to do for the task? What assignment are you giving to your students? Right, so that's the first step. You need to define that. And then after you have defined the purpose of the learning task or the assignment that you want to give to your student, you choose your rubric type. Are you gonna use a holistic rubric or are you gonna use an analytic rubric? Based on what is your requirement, you will have to decide as the course instructor. And once you have decided that, okay, for example, I'm going to use an analytic rubric, I'm gonna develop my own analytic rubric, then you are going to define the criteria. What is the criteria? How many criteria do you wanna have for your rubric? Now remember, we do not wanna to have too many criteria because it's gonna be overwhelming for the students and it's also going to take a lot of time when you want to grade the students or you wanna assess the students, yeah? And once you have defined your criteria, you are going to design the rating scale. How does your rating scale look like? Is it going to start from poor, moderate, good, excellent, yeah? So that is one example of a um, rating scale. And then you are going to write your performance descriptors. So performance descriptors for each scale point. Now, when you develop your rubrics, yeah, the hardest part for me is this writing the performance descriptors. You have to describe the quality of the performance that you want your students to achieve. And then you are going to decide how many marks or how many scores are you going to assign for that particular descriptors, yeah? But the thing that I can share with you, once you have the rubrics ready, then marking becomes a breeze. It's very simple, it's straight to the point, and it makes your marking very manageable, yeah? And, um, I give back the rubrics to my students when um, I have finished marking. So there are times when I allow them to improve the, uh, the assignments. There are times I say, okay, no, you can't improve the assignments, but this is your grade. So they will understand where, where did they go wrong, what was lacking in their uh, assignments and so forth. Yeah? So that is the whole idea why rubrics is really very helpful for your students as well as very helpful to, to me as an instructor. And I hope that uh, you will find it useful as well. Yeah? And I strongly believe that many of you actually have your own rubrics. And um, if you don't have your own rubrics, you should really look for one. You can just Google or you can start um, crafting your own rubrics. Yeah? So let's look at the next session. So we are done with the first session, yeah, which is um, understanding the fundamentals of rubrics. What is a rubric? Yeah? Why do we use a rubric? How does rubric help us as instructors? So let me change, uh, let me stop the uh, sharing, my screen sharing now, and I'm going to start with the hands-on activity. Okay, so are you able to see my screen? This is a Microsoft Word document. How did I actually develop this hands-on activity? I have given questions. These questions is for you to answer, all right? So you ask yourself this question. So let's look at the first question here. Will I use the rubric to assign a grade? Is it going to be yes or is it going to be no? Right now, remember when we do assessment, yeah? Um, if you had actually followed my alternative, uh, sorry, my e assessment session that I did with Kate on the 28th of March, I mentioned that when you give assessment, your assessments could be graded or it could not be graded, meaning that are you going to give scores or are you going to give grade to your students? If your assignments yeah, are not going, to, not going to be graded, do you need a rubric? The answer is still yes, because you give assignment to your student, you want your students to learn. 
and you want them to acquire more knowledge. Yeah? So the rubrics will actually help them to know where is their weakness and where is their, uh, where are their strengths in that sense. The second question, will I use the rubric to give feedbacks so students can improve their performance? Is it going to be yes or no? Is a rubric for a multi-dimensional project or for a simple straightforward assignment? So multi-dimensional project, perhaps sometimes, yeah, it could be a combination of different causes. So your, your colleagues, so you, let's say you teach course A, your colleague teaches course B, and your, the other colleague teaches course C. And all three of you have come up with one multi-dimensional project, in, uh, which is cross, dis I would say cross discipline. So three different subjects, but giving one big project. So do you need a rubric? Answer is still yes. Even if you are giving a simple assignment, yeah, which is based on one topic of your subject, it is best to have a rubric as well. What are the learning outcomes? So what are your learning outcomes? Do you have a learning outcome for that particular lesson? Or is it the learning outcome for the entire course? Right? So a lot of things that uh, you need to decide yeah, when you want to develop the rubric and how will students demonstrate they have learned these outcomes. So this is your first step when you want to develop your rubrics. This is where you define the purpose of the learning task. So let's move on to some Example. So this is an example that um, I have for you. Yeah, the purpose of the assessment. Yeah. So I've used a cooking skill. Yeah. Um, a general skill that everybody is familiar with. Yeah. So what is your purpose of the assessment? So this is the purpose of my assessment. Yeah. Is to assess the student cooking skills midway through a cooking course. We want to give students feedback on cooking skills such as following a recipe and making any necessary adjustments, preparing a variety of ingredients and following instructions and making adjustments so the food is cooked evenly throughout. So I've used an example of baking an apple pie yeah, here, which requires each of these skills and is the task chosen for this assessment. So this is a, a very general kind of example that I can think of uh, because I know many of you are from various fields. Yeah? So once you have defined the purpose of your assessment, then we are going to go to step two. So remember, we have five steps here, right? So you have an idea of what is the purpose of your assignment yeah, or your assessment for the project, then you are going to choose your rubric. So here are some questions here to help you decide whether you are going to be using an analytical, analytic rubric or a holistic rubric, yeah? So here it is. Will I be making a general judgment? Will I be assessing a minor assignment? Will I be providing summative feedback on student overall performance? Once you ask these questions and you answer yes to all these three questions, then most likely a holistic rubric would be your choice. But yeah, if you have the answer yes for all the following questions, will, will I be assessing a multi-dimensional assignment? Okay, sorry for the grammatical error there. Will I be assessing a major product or project? Will I be providing formative feedback about students' performance on individual elements of a learning task? If you say yes to all these questions, then most likely an analytic rubric would be your choice. So, so far um, in my experience, yeah, I have been using a lot of analytic rubric yeah, as compared to holistic because it is more precise and I believe students gain more feedback, yeah? more understanding of what is required from the particular project or the assignment that I've given to my students. 
Once you have answered that, once you have decided whether you want to go for an analytic rubric or a holistic rubric, then you are ready to go to the step three, which is defining your criteria. And remember what I said about criteria? What are the characteristics of your criteria? So here are some questions that would help you with your criteria. Now, this is also a very difficult part to create. Yeah? It goes back to your expertise, your field of expertise. What is your field of expertise? What subject are you teaching? You are teaching home science. Yeah? If you are teaching chemistry, for example, yeah? your knowledge comes into play here. What exactly do you want the students to achieve? What component do you want the students to have? And what is it that you want to measure for your assignment? Yeah? So defining the criteria here is performing a task analysis of the knowledge and skills required for the learning task is one way of defining the criteria. It's a systematic breakdown of how a task is accomplished, which includes subtasks and both manual and mental activities. Yeah? So here are some questions that I've prepared for you. Um, what students should learn from the task? What is it that you want the students to learn from this task? It must be something that you want students to learn or to acquire. What kind of knowledge? What kind of skills? Yeah? And so if you are measuring psychomotor skills. Yeah? How will the students demonstrate that they have learned? Remember, one of the characteristics of a criteria is going to be observable. Something that you can see, yeah? What knowledge, skills, and behaviors are required for the task? Well, sometimes your rubric may just be measuring knowledge. It may not be measuring other things, yeah? So it depends, it, it depends uh, on you. How and how wide your area of uh, measurement, yeah? do you want to go? What steps are required for the task? And what are the characteristics of the final product? And remember, good criteria have the following characteristics. I have that in my slide here, yeah, but just to recall, they should be observable, measurable, yeah? It must be important and essential. It must be an essential part of your learning process, right? Then it is fair to assess your students in that sense. It's got to be distinct from other criteria. So the criteria should not be overlapping. Yeah? So criteria A or criteria one is distinct from criteria two and distinct from criteria three, but they are all related to your project or your assignment. So let's look at this one, yeah? An example of a suitable criteria for baking an apple pie yeah? as shown in table two. So I have decided, yeah? So these are all examples that I've taken from the uh, internet. I've given this, uh, the URL at the bottom of this worksheet here, which you can go and have a look, yeah? But let's look at the relevant criteria. I have three criteria. When you talk about baking an apple pie, these are the three things that is considered. Number one, criteria number one, related to recipe. Criteria, criteria number two, which is apple filling. And criteria number three is the crust. So this is the criteria that has been identified here yeah, for the rubrics that I'm going to use when we want to assess the students in terms of baking and apple pie. So once you have decided what criteria you're going to have, how many criteria, and remember I said you do not have too many criteria, you can have four to five, but not until 10. That's too excessive in my opinion, unless it's a really big project, yeah? which, um, which takes maybe the entire semester, for example. Then once you have designed, uh, you have identified your criteria, you are going to design your rating scale. And remember, your rating scale is the one that is at the top. So this is an example of a rating scale, which has three rating scales, below expectations, mid expectations, and above expectations. And you will notice that this rubric doesn't have any scores, which means that it could be a formative rubric. I'm not going to score the students' assignments, but 
just to ensure that learning um, is taking place for this particular assignment, yeah? And when we have the table ready, right? So these are your rating scales, and these are your criteria on the left-hand side. Then comes the really big task, which is to write the performance descriptors. Remember I said, when you want to describe what are the qualities that the assignment should possess, or what are the qualities that the student have acquired, yeah? when you want to give marks, let's say, for above expectations, or you want to put them, or you want to categorize the students as being, having skills which is above expectations. Now, just to give you an idea, this is just a repetition of what I discussed earlier on in our session for today. Here are some good descriptors. Number one, they have to be observable and measurable. It, is so important yeah, that you can see the descriptors. You can see, oh, this student is much more skilled than the previous students. And you're able to measure that skill. So you can't judge the degree of quality of something that is not observable and measurable. The second one is use parallel parallel language in each point across the scale. Yeah? So what do you mean by parallel language? Yeah? Descriptors need to use parallel and consistent wording in each point across the scale. Don't make up an entirely new description for each rating scale point. Yeah? So here is an example that I have prepared for you. What I mean by parallel language. Now, the criteria that we want to measure is crust. So when you eat an apple pie, right, I'm sure you want a really nice um, flaky yeah, um, crust. You don't want a soggy kind of um, crust, yeah? So let's look at the criteria here. I have two tables here. The first one here, um, cross is soggy, heavy, and pastry, pasty. Cross is, someone too, is somewhat too soft, thick, or hard. Cross is flaky and light with even consistency. You will notice that these three descriptors are not parallel as compared to the one at the bottom. Look at the one at the bottom. Top and bottom crusts are not light and flaky. Top and bottom crusts are somewhat light and flaky. Top and bottom crusts are very light and flaky. So the one at the bottom is all talking about how flaky your apple pie is. But the one at the top talks about how soggy, how heavy it is, how thick the crust is and, and all that. Well, these are actually descriptors, but they are not at the same parallel language uh, as what I meant earlier. Yeah? Meaning that your descriptors, yeah, when it is written, when you craft your descript descriptors, performance descriptors, they must show some progression. So in terms of progression, we talk about below expectations, meets expectations, and above expectations. Once you have decided and you have got that done, yeah, in terms of the parallel language, then indicate the degree to which the standards are met. So just now, when we had seen the criteria for, a, for an apple pie, I had decided that these are the criteria, recipe, apple filling, and crust. You want to measure in terms of these three components, yeah? When you talk about below expectations, you look at the recipe just by looking at this um, descriptors here, yeah, the performance descriptors. Recipe has not been followed correctly, and the pie does not have the correct proportion of sugar, spices, and crusts for the amount of apples and size of pie. As compared to something which is above expectations, the recipe has been followed correctly, 
And pi has exactly the correct proportion of sugar, spices, and crusts for the amount of apples and size of pi. So what is important here is that you have the expertise to decide whether the proportion is correct, all right? Because this is not quantified here. It doesn't say um, how many percent or how many grams of sugar, yeah? But correct proportion, meaning the person who is going to use the rubric as well as the person who is going to assess the students here would be an expert, someone like you, the class instructor, yeah? So these are the three criteria for the apple pie. And I also mentioned when you have prepared your analytic rubric, you can actually transform it into a holistic rubric. So when I transform the holistic rubric, it becomes a little bit different. You can see on the left-hand side, it starts with beginning. Someone is quite immature, yeah, in terms of baking, developing, competent, and someone who is very accomplished, very good at baking apple pie, yeah. And remember, I also mentioned when you want to develop your performance indicators or performance descriptors, the holistic rubric is a summation of all the performance descriptors. So here, when you talk about uh, for beginning, yeah, or beginners. The recipe was not followed mostly correctly. Pie does not have correct proportion of sugar and spices. Apples for the filling were not cut and prepared correctly. Crust is not light and flaky. Pie is not baked evenly throughout with the golden brown crust. These are the summation of the criteria that I had taken from from my analytic rubric. So you can do it vice versa. You can start with a holistic rubric and after a while you feel that the holistic rubric may be too general or um, not useful, not helpful to your students. Uh, you, want a more, you want a more precise rubric, then you can change it. Yeah? But what is important is that both rubrics have got performance indicators. And these performance indicators is one of the hardest uh, to craft yeah, or to, to develop because it needs expertise. When you talk about apple pie, what makes a perfect apple pie? You need to be an expert in coming up with a good apple pie. Yeah? So when you relate it to education or to our field of studies, yeah, you have to decide what exactly is considered as quality when you want to measure students' performance. And it boils down to you as the instructor. And also, if you have time, maybe. I have seen... Um, lecturers, yeah, who actually came up with their, um, developed the rubrics together with their students, all right? So that, that is really good because students have, will be able to give you really good feedback. What do they want to be assessed? And sometimes the criteria or the performance indicators, we may not be aware, you know, if something doesn't come to our mind and students give us ideas to improve our rubrics. I think that's uh, the end of uh, this second session. Yeah? So these are the uh, website yeah, that you can actually go and have a look. You should be uh, able to access my worksheet for now. And I like to know if there's anyone who has their own rubrics and would like to share with us for today's uh, afternoon session. You can actually share it on the screen and let's discuss about your rubrics. I I'd like to uh, invite anyone who would be interested to do that. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, the screen now, just in case someone has uh, some rubrics to share. Yeah? Okay, I'm going to look while waiting for anyone who wants to share the rubrics. Uh, let me go through the questions, yeah, on the chat. From Lini Hashim. 
can we use the same rubric to assess different psychomotor levels? I think for each psychomotor levels should have their own performance descriptors. Yeah, but you can put it together in the same rubric, which has the same rating scale. So for each of your psychomotor, let's say P1, you, I'm sure you have different criteria for P2. And for P2, you have different criteria for P3 and so forth, yeah? So um, the answer would be each psychomotor should have their own performance indicators as well as their own criteria. Is there any questions that some, um, some of you would like to ask as well? Um, our moderator would unmute you, yeah? So currently everybody is muted. I don't see any more questions. Um, I also do not see anyone um, sharing or indicating that they want to share the rubrics. Now, I uh, just before we end our session, yeah, I like to share with you how I administer or I share my rubrics with my students. Yeah, when I give my students the rubrics, I give it together with the assignment. I upload it to the Putra Blast and. The rubrics is either when, you, let's say, for example, uh, before, before this uh, pandemic, we all ask our students to hand up printed assignments, yeah? And I ask them to print up their own rubrics as well. But when you have, uh, in this situation where we don't see our students, they are not in campus, all their assignments are all uploaded here yeah, to our Putra Blast. They're all in uh, digitized form. The rubrics, you can just grade them. Um, in the sense that, yeah, they, you don't need to print them, right? So having rubrics, I would actually encourage you to have a rubric, which is a one page rubric, which is much easier to handle. If you have pages and pages of rubrics, it will take quite a bit of time for you to grade your students, yeah? Unless it is necessary to have so many criteria. So keep your rubrics, yeah? So if you notice that Rubrics that I shared with you are all one page long only. Very easy, straight to the point, and um, they have less than eight criteria. Yeah? So when you craft your rubrics, choose the most important criteria for that particular assessment or the assignment that you have assigned to your students. Are there any more questions that you'd like to ask? I don't see any more questions. So perhaps maybe I can hand it back to uh, the moderator. So don't forget to take your attendance. I think there's an attendance um, that you can actually sign up. Uh, yeah, bro. Thank you. Um, so on behalf of Kate, um, we would like to thank Prof. Uh, Dr. Wong Sun for the uh, webinar today. And to all attend attendees, please uh, do not forget to record your attendance uh, using the link in the chat box. Okay, so... To Today we finish early, 15 minutes. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, um, hari ini tiada gangguan. Uh, Masih one question. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. And thank you very much, everyone. Participants okay. for today. Thank you. Bye.